So Dave, that's a lot different than I heard on Twitter, which uh, they were talking about are doing the eeny, meeny, miny, mo approach. Yeah, well, you know, it's funny you should mention that because I think a lot of people were Ren Leggy, Client Portfolio Manager with ARK Invest. On this season of The Switch, we're going to address the four market inefficiencies. Uh, as always, we'll be joined by ETF Trends to facilitate the discussion and make sure that we don't leave anything unanswered. Uh, so let's get the conversation started with the siloization of Wall Street. Yeah, it's a great subject, Ren. And when you look at the traditional model on how to run a fund company, uh, you hire a bunch of MBAs and CFAs, you put them in a room and you throw a bunch of stocks at them and say, do your stuff. And, and that tends to be traditionally how this whole thing gets set up. So what do you see that's wrong with that model? Uh, so we see that, you know, technology is impacting all sectors and industries, right? And this notion of, you know, having a sector analyst, right? Uh, or in, in some cases, we've even seen, you know, market cap uh, analyst. That is going away. We think you should really start to think about restructuring the research team and actually having analysts, which is what we do by technology, because technology is really seeping into every sector. Uh, and so you could be blindsided. Some of these analysts could be blindsided by, uh, you know, some of these newer technologies that impact or could potentially disrupt entire industries, right? Uh, so if you're, you're stuck on sectors uh, and industries, you may miss kind of how totally different technology coming out of left field uh, is going to disrupt uh, that, that current industry. And they may not have that expertise, right? AI is a great example. You know, AI is impacting healthcare. Uh, a lot of healthcare analysts aren't AI experts, right? So you have to have, and, and they've been, Wall Street has been very siloized in that nature where there's not a lot of communication between the teams in some cases. They're very competitive, uh, right? They, they may not be incentivized to really talk to one another and share ideas. So how do you deal with the old classic Wall Street sector problem where, you know, you've got your energy analyst and he's, you know, paying attention to all the energy stocks. You're never going to get that guy to say, hey, by the way, all these energy stocks are terrible. Don't buy any of them. It, just by moving it to technologies, obviously, you've got folks focused on AI. How do you make sure that they're comfortable saying, hey, you know what, AI and healthcare? not a thing or no good investment here. There's always that problem of these people's embedded bias if it's the thing they're covering. So how do you how do you fight against that? Yes, and that's a great point, right? Um, and that's why we utilize kind of this cross collaboration with our research and our teams, right? So we always have our primary analyst uh, that has that expertise in the technology that they're researching assigned to the stock that's associated with that technology. But then we could have a secondary or maybe even a third analyst covering it from a different perspective or a different technology if that company uh, touches on on those technologies, if it touches more than one technology. So as we're modeling, you know, we could have that that other analyst kind of looking over their shoulder saying, well, from an AI perspective, you know, this could impact uh, genomics from this angle, right? Otherwise, if you're in those, if you stay in those silos, you wouldn't get that cross collaboration. And I think that's really an important aspect. You know, we all come together as a team at the end of every week to talk about some of these breakthroughs in some of our research. And that gives the opportunity to, you know, for maybe our robotics analysts to, to weigh in on some of the breakthroughs that have been happening on AI and how that could impact their space, right? And then they go back the next week and, and kind of go back and dig in deeper into their research uh, and, and kind of incorporate some of that. Hey, Ren, while we've got you, humor me for a minute and, and let's give us a little inside baseball. You folks have had high conviction on Tesla for a long period of time. Explain to me where Tesla came from the, the research team and, and, and how that all kind of came together to, to the point where you folks make, made a big commitment early on. Yes, so what we, we see with Tesla, right? If you look at the Wall Street analysts out there covering Tesla, uh, most are value-oriented 
automotive uh, analyst, right? I think it's 90% of the analysts out there are automotive analysts. Uh, and they're focused on, you know, uh, a technology that's been around for basically over a century, right? The internal combustion engine. Uh, you know, Tesla is built from the ground up to be an uh, electrical vehicle company. Totally different technology. This is mechanical engineering, totally different skill set, right? Mechanical engineering versus electrical engineering. And so we look at it from a, a much different perspective. And we also have analysts uh, that are covering it from a much different perspective, right? So we have a battery technology energy storage analyst, Sam Corris who's covering it uh, from the lithium ion battery side or technology side, right? We think Tesla is way ahead of others on the autonomous front, uh, autonomous driving vehicles. Uh, so we have our autonomous technology slash mobility as a service analyst, Tad Shakini, covering it from that perspective. And then, you know, AI, given that it's, it's powering, a, a, you know, many of these aspects, um, especially uh, autonomous vehicles, we have William Summerlin, uh, covering it from an AI uh, chip perspective. That's really the central kind of nervous system of these autonomous vehicles. So we have three analysts working together uh, to understand Tesla, understand the technologies that they're, the underlying technologies, uh, and, and sizing the, that opportunity. And it's no surprise to us that we're coming to, you know, a much different conclusion than the broader market when you have automotive analysts covering uh, that stock. So, Dave, that's a lot different than I heard on Twitter, which uh, they were talking about are doing the eeny, meeny, miny, mo approach. Yeah, well, you know, it's funny you should mention that because I think a <laughs> lot of people were surprised on your latest fund, right, the Space Fund, uh, which, you know, Art X, which I think really interesting fund. But people looked inside that and they said, wait a minute, there's a 3D printing in this. What's going on? And then you, I dug into the research and it turns out like almost everything that's supersonic these days is being 3D printed by aerospace engineers. Talk a little bit about how you get the overlap between these funds in a really kind of constructive way. We, we see a lot of overlap uh, because there's overlap in the technologies, right? AI is an, a key enabler for the space exploration, right? The primary technology being reusable rockets. Uh, but AI is helping that. 3D printing is is going into the parts and the, the manufacturing of these rockets. Uh, so, you know, we also invest not only in these underlying technologies, but we're also investing in kind of the key enablers of these technologies. And that's where the 3D printing comes in, right? That's still very kind of an earlier stage technology in that it's the market is is very fragmented, right? And there's only one, we look at it at the, the end use part manufacturing space, right? What you just mentioned. Uh, and it's only about 1% penetrated. So still early days. Uh, so it's, it's, it's unclear who the, all the winners will be in each of these spaces. We'll, we'll probably see some consolidation, right? So we want to have broad exposure to that enabling technology. So that, that's what we're seeing is kind of an opportunity. And a lot of investors don't have exposure to that um, because, you know, there, there's not, you know, funds that are, are, thematic in that approach to, to provide that exposure to these, you know, very attractive opportunities. Yeah. And another place where, you know, it's easy to get to miss something, right? I think most people would say, oh, I'm going to put a space fund together. And they're not going to think about 3D printing being an integral part of that. I think it's part of why it pays to really get under the hood here. Yes. And, and the other thing is, you know, we're, we're not going to just create a fund just because a lot of people are talking about that technology, right? Uh, it has to make sense from an investment perspective. We've never launched a fund uh, because you know, people are saying, hey, I'll invest in that fund. Uh, we, we launch funds because we see there's a huge market inefficiency right, uh, out there. And we wanna allow investors to gain exposure to those funds. At the end of the day, that's our job is to provide exposure to these exponential growth opportunities. Uh, and space is just a good example of, you know, not many people are paying attention. You know, aerospace industry has been around for, what, 70 plus years. Uh, it has been very slow mover. Now, because of some of these other enabling technologies, we're getting to a point where this could be a massive opportunity. The market is just not factoring in uh, the potential you know, if you look five, 10 years yeah. out. Ren, when you look at the portfolios and the constituents in the portfolios, it looks like there are a lot of different companies that don't have a lot in common. But as you're walking through this, it sounds like a lot of these companies, in fact, do have a lot in common. Absolutely. I mean, there's, there's many of these are, you know, 3D printing companies are working with 
you know, uh, some of these robotics companies. So they're they're all connected, and and that's how we further leverage this research. And you know, if we were silized, right? That that's the topic we're talking about. If we were silized, we would miss some of these uh, these opportunities. And you know, having the analyst team uh, with backgrounds, domain expertise in each of these technologies helps them identify these opportunities and also how, you know, these opportunities are impacted by other technologies. You know, again, it's, it's very collaborative and I think that's what's really important. Uh, and that's, that's the environment we've created at ARC uh, is to work together, share ideas in a rapidly changing uh, environment. Thanks, Dave and Tom. As always, it's been fun. We'll see you on the next episode.